Welcome back, everybody, to episode two of Vertical Blocks, where we're here joined by our chief research officer, Professor Bernard Schultz. We'll be looking into what's going on behind the scenes in terms of our research and development and what's most important for the Phantom team at the moment. So thanks for joining us, uh, Bernard. Nice to, to have me. Thank you. Yep. It's uh, really exciting to have you here. I, I think this will this conversation will hopefully bring um, a lot more clarity and understanding to uh, the general Phantom community and, and everybody who follows our news as to what it is that your team's working on. I know you had a really interesting conversation with Michael, so I think we can go further into some of these subjects. But also, you know, just to get started, I think it would be awesome to, to learn a little bit about yourself. You know, what's brought you, what, what got you started, what's brought you to here? Um, we can cover everything along the way to, from, from, you know, what got you started in, with your interest in technology all the way to uh, souffle and everything else you've worked on and, and how you uh, got involved with Phantom. Okay, yeah, let, let's start. So um, if, if I go back to my childhood, so I, I got really interested in, in computers very early on. So uh, I have to go back to the year 1982 when I uh, got my first computer from uh, my parents. It, it was a Commodore 64. I grew up on the countryside um, in Austria and there was not too much to do, uh, but... Um, that was sort of a revelation, and I, I really got excited programming my small little home computer. It was in those days a small 8-bit computer in BASIC, and sort of from those days on, I was fascinated by computers and finished high school, started um, my computer science studies at the Technical University in Vienna and graduated from there. Um, and also started there as an academic. Um, later on, I got an offer here in Australia to work as an academic at the University of Sydney, but I didn't just stay the whole time as a lecturer here in Australia, but also worked in industry. So I took always leave from my academic duties. And for example, I co-founded the Sun Microsystems Labs in Brisbane in Australia with a colleague of mine, so Christina Sifuentes, and together we were working on security analysis. So we were working on uh, machinery which can identify uh, security bugs in system software. For Sun Microsystems in those days, it was very important because they open sourced the Solaris operating system. And their concern was that uh, because the source code um, was way back then available to people, that um, there will be, there would be a lot of attacks happening. And so they wanted to uh, make it safer. And we, we came up with a tool, which is called Buffet. Sun Microsystems was later purchased by Oracle. Uh, but this this project still keeps going even after so many years, and it's used by thousands of engineers every day to uh, harden C C plus plus code, especially in in the system um, area. But um, later, I went back to industry again. So this we are talking about 2013 to roughly 2015, and um, there, the task was really to automate uh, security analysis, or you can say the technical term for this would be static program analysis. And uh, we wanted um, machinery where we can specify security analysis in a much better way um, so that um, the developers uh, can deliver very specific bug finding tools much faster. And, and that was sort of the starting point for a new programming language. We call this programming language souffle. It's now widely used in industry, but also in academia to teach uh, students declarative programming, but with this sort of more declarative approach of programming, um, these bug finding tools, which are very important in industry to identify 
um, security issues, all sorts of kind of, of bug issues uh, fully automatically. And um, it, it sort of helps the, the community at large. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. And uh, also what strikes me is that you've spent so much time, not just in academia, but in the field itself. You know, how do you feel that those two, um, those two playing fields kind of interact with each other, both the work, the work you do at a theoretical level and then when it comes to, to actually putting it into application, you know, how do you feel that those two complement themselves? Since, uh, you know, generally speaking, it seems like people either live in one, one sphere or the other. Oh, that, that's a very good question. So uh, in academia, there are mainly two types of researchers. So one, they get inspired by the field itself. So normally you can think of theoretical computer scientists. So they really attack hard problems in computer science, like questions, big questions like is NP equal P? So that these are really outstanding questions. And so they keep themselves busy uh, trying to understand these very deep questions. Um, the other type is more uh, finding real problems in the real world and trying to solve them. And I'm inspired more by real world problems. So I get really interested when I can apply my computer science knowledge to problems which affect people. And uh, with that, I can really excel. And I noticed this. And um, mind you, my industry placements um, were always in industrial research lab setups. So they are not really pure industry placements. They are really um, research labs, which sort of are the missing link between industry and academia. And their major sort of um, task is to take the latest findings in computer science and implement them in industry so that uh, we have um, better productivity at the end and, and, and progress in industry. And with this penchant for, you know, your, your primary interest in being in, in solving real world problems, what was it that attracted you to work in blockchain technology? If that's, you know, whether that's at a philosophical level a theoretical level or, or, or a problem solving level, you know, what was it that really compelled you to, to break into the field? If I give an honest answer here, I have to say it was driven by my students. So I had this new programming language souffle and the main idea was to uh, identify security issues in the Java JDK. So that was the starting point. But I knew um, we need to broaden our application base for the programming language souffle. And so I was super interested finding as many applications for souffle as possible so that I can um, guarantee um, sort of the survival of the language. So programming language needs applications. and. Um, for this, I, I needed applications. And the students way back, so it was about 2016, 17, started to get super interested in, in blockchains. And um, yeah, we, we looked into blockchains. We were interested trying to write security analysis for um, programmable blockchains. In those days, it was Ethereum that was the only one around. And we discovered immediately quite big issues, how to phrase and write these security analysis for uh, smart contracts. So we needed a decompiler. So that then we started work with um, decompilation technology and finding ways how, to can, how we can convert EVM bytecode back to something more machine comprehensible. And uh, we had an own decompiler project here at the University of Sydney, but then it uh, led to um, uh, decompilers entirely written in Souffle. And this is now the Gigahorse project. So this is um, the project of uh, Professor Smaragdakis from the University of Athens, 
which is also related to Phantom now uh, with the watchdog program. But I guess we will talk about this later. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I was thinking maybe that was one of the topics we touch on last, but there's clearly a connection here, you know, with your past work in insecurity. It's a, a low level programming, essentially, uh, and then moving to where you are now at Phantom, working with programs such as Watchdog. And so, you know, we may have a variety of an audience here. Some may be very technical minded. Some may be more just um, curious and, and learn about this for the first time. Could you maybe explain uh, at a high level what, what are some of these problems that Watchdog solves? And particularly, uh, as you mentioned to me in a previous conversation, what some of the problems are with compilers and maybe even going as so far as to explain what is a compiler and what does it does when we're, what does it do when we're thinking about something like uh, deploying a, a solidity contract? contractor and solidity or any other um, smart contract programming language? So normally these programs are executed on the ledger, but it's not really the program the programmer writes. So the programmers normally use high level um, languages like solidity um, or wiper. So they're different types of smart contract languages, but um, the most established one um, it seems is solidity. And uh, what it's doing, it really, uh, it needs some execution environment and it can't be directly the ASCII characters of the program. That would be too cumbersome and not very efficient. So what's been done, and it's not really a new approach. This has been done many times in the past before, a very prominent example for this is um, the, um, the Java language. So the Java language, how it's executing Java programs is, first there is a compiler which takes the Java program and translates it to Java bytecode. And then there is the Java virtual machine which then executes the bytecode. So the actual program, the programmer programmed. And in a blockchain setup, it's very similar. So what we have here is that we have the Solidity program, which is not directly executed, but first put through a Solidity compiler, and that generates bytecode. It's not the Java bytecode, but it's also called bytecode. It's sort of an abstract machine it's not a real CPU like an Intel CPU, but we call this is an abstract machine. It has some notions of memory stack and storage. And with that virtual machine, we then can execute the Solidity program on the blockchain. So and, the, sorry, go uh, ahead. Go ahead, please. And, um, and the problem now is coming back to um, the analysis of programs, which, which is important for blockchains because we have this issue that they carry high monetary values. So we, we need to be very careful what we are doing in terms of programs because a lot of money can be lost. And so we need to make sure as uh, programmers uh, that everything is correct. And sometimes it's so complex that this task of ensuring the correctness, we require uh, mechanical help. And uh, this is then uh, the security analysis. One example is Watchdog, which takes the um, bytecode of Solidity. It's called the abstract machine. I forgot to mention is called the Ethereum virtual machine and takes this bytecode and translates it to something more comprehensible for a machine and then performs um, quite complex analyses to understand whether the program is doing what it's supposed to do. I mean, this is something that uh, the, the more I talk about it and the more I learn about it, the, the closer I get to wrapping my head around uh, its fundamental importance in, in terms of baking this in to our functionality and our feature offering, if you want to call it that earlier. Uh, but just to contextualize it uh, and make it a little less theoretical, you know, what are the what are the potential pitfalls or risks of blockchains that that choose to leave this for a later stage of their maturity 
uh, and leaving that out there? Like, what are some of the possible exploits or things that could go wrong um, by not analyzing smart contracts after they're deployed at the at the bytecode level? So the analysis of the correctness needs to be done at all levels, of course. So it's not just one level of analysis is sufficient to prove the correctness or at least have a common understanding in the team that it's plausibly correct. And um, what I mean with levels is of course, the programmer needs to have a good understanding of the Solidity bytecode, uh, sorry, of the Solidity program that this is correct. And um, then the problem is that the compiler, which translates that high level program, the Solidity program to bytecode, has no notions of correctness proofs. So normally, there are only few compilers which have these notions of uh, correct translation. Uh, and uh, Solidity the Solidity compiler has not this property. So what this means is that um, when the translation is happened, then there could be potentially bugs in the compiler. So just small little mistakes by the com Solidity compiler writers and they may translate to security vulnerabilities on the blockchain. And the crown truth here is really then the EVM bytecode. So if you start analyzing the EVM bytecode, you can get more certainty because this is closer what the actual program is behaving on the blockchain. So this is really the, the actual, you know, execution environment and with that you know more bugs can be potentially exposed using these these techniques like a watchdog so it's really important for the community to do risk analysis at all levels this starts with the source code this start uh, continues with the bytecode but also with the virtual machine, we need guarantees and the um, uh, client program, which runs basically the network, uh, we need their security assumptions as well, or security guarantees. All this we don't have at the moment, and but any, any means to achieve this, like the watchdog system is, great because it gets us closer to this um, ideal of all components are verified. And with verification, I mean something very specific. I mean that we see programs as mathematical objects and we prove properties about these programs, mathematical properties. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating because I think that when people think about security, uh, it's not the main thing they think about. They just think as long as it's good enough, it's good enough. Uh, but good enough generally just entails audits at the smart contract programming language level without taking into consideration, as you just explained, the risks inherent to the compiler itself performing in some sort of way that's unexpected, which could lead to larger problems down the road. And as we've mentioned before on, on uh, other calls and, and uh, Twitter spaces, this is something that's going to be available uh, to any developers launching their their uh, smart contracts on Phantom, so um, this is super interesting stuff, and it, it's really exciting. And I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing teams implement this and and share their feedback uh, shortly. But um, so for the the next really important topic, the hot topic that I think everyone wants to know about, and I certainly want to know about as well, uh, is the Phantom Virtual Machine. So you just mentioned. Uh, the EVM quite a few times, the Ethereum virtual machine, which I know is something you've spent quite a lot of time thinking about. So uh, at a high level, you know, what are the improvements that, that you believe that Phantom can make by moving over to our own Phantom virtual machine, uh, as opposed to sticking with the Ethereum virtual machine? And um, what are some of the, the sort of stages or, or the, the research and development that goes into getting from you know, point A to point Z, because for some people, 
they they it's really difficult to conceptualize what is the phantom virtual machine exactly where does it fit into the whole picture what does it consist of um and so i'd be curious to hear you know in, in your words what is it and and how can it make a difference for phantom and uh and help us become even more competitive than we are right now okay um let, let's break it down this question in, into its its parts uh, so I think there are two important objectives here. Uh, one objective is performance. So um, the Ethereum virtual machine was invented without having a large number of transactions on the Ethereum blockchain. So um, it was invented some time ago. It, 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 it has evolved over time, but um, they couldn't design uh, the virtual machine based on historical data. Phantom has now the advantage that we have now about 44 million blocks on the blockchain. And with that, we can do very precise analysis uh, and look what would be the best possible design for this virtual machine. and. Here we are talking about performance in the sense of how can we improve uh, the number of transactions we can execute um, on a daily basis. And it's not just the sheer volume we want to increase, it's also the latency. So how quickly when we uh, issue a transaction, how quickly can we settle a transaction on the ledger, um, on the blockchain, and these kind of performance questions are really important to make phantom scale. So we want to really provide uh, the a, a, a system which delivers scale, and um, that that is a challenging problem because if you compare it to um, Visa cards or MasterCards, I mean, our transactions we can deliver per day is, is still a small, small fraction in comparison to systems which uh, are set in place on a daily basis and, and work at much larger scale. And it's really a limitation of the technology we have at the moment. And, and this limitation needs to be overcome. And, and so it's only one part this virtual machine, but the problem is that uh, suddenly these transactions are programmable and therefore they need to be super fast to get this the number of transactions up maybe to 100 million a day. So, I mean, these are just numbers. We None of us of these blockchains can really achieve um, if you want to have all these transactions consistent, I'm not talking about side channels and all this, I'm talking directly on the blockchain. And um, it's, it's a challenge and the community needs to pick up these challenges to be relevant in, in real life. Yeah, well said. I mean, one thing that stuck with me from a, an earlier conversation was you mentioned how different it is to uh, work towards optimization on a blockchain versus regular uh, software programming? You know, what, why is that? Well, if we talk about transactions, again, this is the performance. I forgot to say the second part would be security, but let's uh, talk maybe about security later. But let's go back to performance. So we did in the last um, few months a performance analysis or we call this profiling and the idea is really to look very carefully what these programs are really doing on the blockchain and we see that normal understanding of performance is broken on the blockchain so normally you would see in programs general programs running on your iphone running on your desktop computer you would see normally the 90-10 rules. So the 90-10 rule says 90% of the time, only 10% of the code is executed. What this means is that most of the time, programs are spent in loops, you know, just iterating the same instructions again and again. 
And the community in programming languages really specialized on this. So they found wonderful ways, decades of sort of research is went into this, wonderful ways to understand how to optimize uh, these, these programs following the 1910 rule. And, and we found out that most of the time, these transactions or these smart contracts execute their only their instructions once. So we are talking about sequential code. So these transactions or smart contracts are very simple programs. You might have some conditions. You say, if something happens to this, if something happens to that, but there are no loop constructs around it. And so optimization techniques we learned in the last few decades in compiler construction and programming languages are not applicable here. But what we see is that the same smart contract is executed again and again. And we are talking here that some smart contracts are executed 100 million times again and again. Uh, we are talking about, um, for example, swaps. We are talking about um, uh, multi-chain contracts. So we are talking about very specific contracts which are very small when executed on its own and only once. So we are talking about time spans of microseconds or milliseconds at most. But the problem is that if you multiply these time durations with millions or billions of time, they consume time. And that's the challenge of optimizing these programs that classical optimization techniques fail for, for these programs, for these smart contracts. Well said. I mean, the other thing you were going to cover there uh, as part of that explanation was security as well, if you want to go back into that. So security is, is a big issue. And the holy grail of security is verification. The problem is that verification is very, very expensive to achieve. You need an army of PhD students and professors doing uh, small systems like, for example, we had here in Australia a, a poster child for verification is, is the SLE4 kernel. So it's an operating system. They proved the correctness or some properties of correctness for an operating system, but it took them years. And again, a lot of PhD students and a lot of professors just doing this. And something similar we would need to achieve for the blockchain community. So we are, we are talking here about proving the correctness of applications. So proving the Solidity programs, proving the compilers, translating these Solidity programs to bytecode, and then also proving the runtime environment. We are talking about proving the correctness of the virtual machine, proving the clients running the network, uh, doing the transaction, performing the consensus. So we need a lot of proofs. What we have seen in the past is that some of these proofs uh, have been attempted and they're partial proofs for um, system components, but we don't have it for the complete system. And, and these are one of the big challenges ahead so that we can really fully trust the system not that there could be exploits, but what we say is under these specifications, so what we think should be the functionality of the system, under this specification, the, the system works correctly. There could be a problem with the specification. So there could be issues, um, anomalies uh, may arise because the specification was not done correctly. But if we have this, we have much better trust in the functionality of, of the system components running these, these very um, big blockchains, which we have at the moment. 
I think even even taking a step back there and, and sort of zooming out and looking at all these components, you know, even for people who've been in the space for a while, the concept of, of the blockchain it can be very abstract. You know, there's the phantom virtual machine. There's Lachesis, the consensus mechanism. There's data storage and availability. How, how do these different what are the different buckets that interoperate with each other and what are the relative functions insofar as how do they all tie back to the phantom virtual machine just to understand what kind of load the phantom virtual machine will absorb from the rest of the system, if, if that's an accurate way of, of phrasing the question. Yeah, yeah so um, phantoms network um, consists of nodes and these nodes replicate the ledger. So it's really just in a classical sense, a ledger where you can put entries into it. And these ledger is replicated. So every node has its own ledger. And via the consensus protocol um, called Lachesis, it tries to keep the ledger consistent among these nodes. And this is done via something called asynchronous consensus protocol. So it's quite different to what Ethereum at the moment is doing. So there it's um, the idea that there are miners and um, it's you give miners a puzzle and to solve. And the first miner which solves that puzzle is allowed to put the next block on the blockchain. Um, Phantom does something different. So it uh, does not rely on crypto puzzles. Um, it relies on... Um, voting it's it's like an election so you, you, the nodes very specific one called validators start voting um they have um some money attached to this so they this is called a stake and um with that stake they are allowed to vote on the consistency of the ledger and they are rewarded for this so there is some stake reward, I mean, a reward which is given to um, the validators. And um, this is how the ledger is made consistent. The problem is the ledger itself is not on paper, of course. It's, it's a database on its own, in its own right. And this database needs to be fast. We, 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 not, we haven't put a lot of attention to it, but when we did the profiling, we noticed that a lot of time is spent in the database. So we need much better storage techniques for executing these transactions. Of course, we did this in a very extreme situation in the last few weeks and months. We basically imported events, not from the network, we imported it from a file. So this is really a, a worst case scenario because networks would not never be as fast as reading events from a file. But with that, we stress tested the storage and we see to achieve a goal like 100 million transactions per day, we, we need to improve the database um, here um, for, for the ledger. But there are other components in, in uh, client software. So there is, for example, um, network components, the consensus protocol. Um, there are systems components um, related to how to um, connect financial applications to clients. If you run an application, you don't want to run the full software stack of um, the ledger in that application, that, that would be very wasteful. So instead you have sort of an interface where you can, a gateway you can say, where you can connect a phantom network node with a financial application. And this is called an RPC API. So it's remote procedure um, call um, and and with that, you applications can access indirectly the ledger, and and so there there are many many components in um, a client, and 
and all need a lot of attention to improve the performance of of um, of, of blockchains. And this is not it's it's not just phantom. Everyone has to work on this to achieve better performance, uh, so that we really can reach targets like a Visa Card or any other bigger commercial applications out there. Yeah, needless to say, uh, the blockchain is a multidisciplinary uh, space to be in. Um, but what, one thing that's really stood out to me since you've joined the team, Bernard, is this, uh, this the, the rigorous approach you've taken towards uh, what you're calling opera profiling, right? Um, so, and, and you published a report on this, which, which you were just talking about a minute ago, but I'd, I'd love to understand a little bit more about how your team is working on this, uh, the different approaches you take and and why you think doing this the way that you are almost um, with an academic lens in a way and then putting it into practice is the, is the route that you've decided to go um, as chief research officer. Well, I'm, I'm a strong believer in empirical research. What this means is that I only trust observations. I, I don't like that hearing from engineers, oh, I tested it on a small little test net and I had this and that discovery. I want the true thing. I want to understand uh, the performance behavior of the client software of Opera um, on the whole blockchain. And through these observations, we see the performance bottlenecks, for example, and then we can work on these performance bottlenecks, which are not just the virtual machine. It, it, it will uh, go across the, the whole stack. And um, it will be related, for example, to storage. That, that will be a very hot topic in, in our research team. But also, we will look into this very specific execution behavior of, um, of smart contracts. We are very much interested in this to understand what can we do. Small smart contracts executed millions of times, but there are no loops. And, and how to deal with that and how we can fine tune so that we can achieve um, a target with huge transactions um, per day for Phantom. So that, that's sort of the idea. Stress testing the system, identifying the bottlenecks, crystallizing the research questions, um, attacking these research questions, and then handing them over to the development team and, and so that there is a product at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, from when you got here and started working on this to, to where you are today and what you've learned in this research, what are maybe some of the assumptions you had about scalability and where it could be most quickly improved that were maybe proved correct or that were proved wrong or where you, where you learned something that was unexpected in terms of where we should be focusing the majority of our efforts from an R&D perspective? So I, I had some assumptions about Ethereum. And so we, we started a small little technical report with one of our undergrad students three, four years ago. And um, I had already some assumptions, but I was not sure about Phantom. So um, that required clarity. And so we had to really build these, these tools for profiling. And, and that, that was a challenge in its own right. Um, and through the profiling, we had some revelations, again, related to the uh, performance behavior of Phantom's specific uh, smart contract. So you see, you know, blockchains conceptually are all very similar. But the programs which are executed on specific blockchains may vary. And, and so we wanted to have the ground truth for Phantom. And by doing so, we, we saw, for example, that storage is a big issue. So we, we need 
to attack this. But also, I mean, that um, the 9010 rule, so that uh, programs spend time in loops, um, well, the, this doesn't hold for Phantom's application at all. So we need to really focus on these aspects um, in, in the months to come. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like what we're really doing here is measuring twice so that then we can cut once. Um, and if I'm understanding correctly, it seems like in, in this process that is the phantom virtual machine, right? Because it's not a flip that you just switch on. Uh, the, the bulk of it is understanding the problem first, doing the research required to carve out the steps required to be taken, and then taking those steps rather than what I think a layman such as myself would assume, which is just kind of getting into the weeds and starting to do things and figuring it out on the way. We're taking sort of the, the, the other approach of doing this very thorough research with the profiling, understanding what the problems are that we need to tackle, and then setting forth to tackle them. Does that sound about right? Yes, I mean, it's, it's very classic in science. So we do first the analysis, and then we identify the problems. And from that, we synthesize a solution. And um, this is much better because Phantom is a reasonable organization in the blockchain world, but we do not have the number of engineers like Google or the Amazons. And so we need to be very, very smart how we use our resources. And my suggestion was to use this more empirical approach where we measure, understand, and then from there we identify the problems, we come up with new solutions, and then we implement these solutions. And then because we know they attack the problems we observed first, the solutions hopefully is, are better than, um, you know, just saying, oh, I have an idea, let's, let's do it. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, staying away from the impulsive uh, measures. But yeah. I wanted to ask you on that note, you know, your, your team is small, but it's, it's mighty and you are building uh, an all-star team of your own. Uh, what are some of the profiles that you're looking uh, to, to attract to that team? And maybe who are some of the role, what are some of the roles that you've already filled in terms of um, the technical resources that we want as we scale out this organization, this technology? Oh, that, that's good because this is a perfect job, Ed. So I, we, are, we are looking for... Um, academically trained people. So we, we really would like um, to have people with higher degrees so that they understand the scientific approach. So we would like to have people uh, who are used to write papers. We would like to have people who had already some industrial experience. So ideally, if you are working in an industrial research lab and you would like to um, you know expand your work experiences in 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 terms of finances then this kind of uh, profile we are looking for so uh, we yeah we, we would like to have people with higher degrees and industrial research lab experiences, th these would be the best suited for the job because, I mean, this is what we are doing. We, we try, we, well, we are doing it, we are setting up a research lab in Phantom, doing this uh, very focused research on practical problems, synthesizing solutions for them, and then handing these solutions over to the development team. That That's sort of what I think is the best way forward for Phantom so that we can be smart tailoring the solutions to the actual problems. Fantastic. Yes. If you're, if you're listening to this and you're technically minded with some academic experience behind you under your belt, please feel free to reach out to us info at phantom.foundation uh, and we can connect you to, to Bernard. Um, but in terms of those you already have on your team, Bernard, I know you've made some recent hires who are working on these problems with you. Uh, is there anything you could share about uh, some of these uh, recent Phantom Foundation, uh, let's say, uh, new recruits? Yeah. Sure. So we, we are still a very small team, but it, it's a very strong team. So we were 
um, immensely lucky attracting such talent in this very short period of time. So we got um, Vasuvi Sorsong. So she used to work for SAP research in databases. And uh, her knowledge in databases is it's a God blessing that we have someone like this because we have a database problem when we talk about ledgers. We, we have this storage issue and that needs to be addressed. And uh, she has this um, really um, strong background, how to measure databases, how to uh, do the data analytics about the performance and in databases in general and high performance, like she did for her PhD, some GP, GPU work. So it's, it's a perfect fit having Vasuvi on board. But then also we have um, uh, Herbert Jordan and uh, he joined recently from Google, uh, but he has also extensive experience in industrial research labs. So he used to work as a research assistant at Oracle Labs in, in Brisbane. We set up together the Souffle um, compiler. Uh, so he has extensive background in programming languages and that's really needed for the phantom virtual machine. And um, then um, the third person we have in the team is uh, Kamil Yesek. And uh, Kamil's expertise is really directly in blockchain. So he used to be my postdoc at the University of Sydney and um, uh, he, he has extensive experience how to sort of uh, work with um, uh, blockchains in general, understanding um, storage requirements. And yeah, so we have a perfect team for the performance aspects at the moment, but I feel we need to expand more when it comes to security. So we need more people in the security space in near future so that we can attack all these security issues at all levels, from the source code level to the compiler, to the virtual machine and the client itself. That's really exciting to, to hear about everything you're working on. I mean, I know you've been putting out these uh, this great series of articles and I know there's more coming, but uh, to hear it from you is it's really inspiring. So. Uh, I think every, everyone will be happy to, to hear these updates. And uh, yeah, I mean, as you said, security and, and scaling and optimization in terms of, of speed and performance are, are just as important, go hand in hand, right? They're two sides of the same coin. So, uh, you know, that being said, that's a lot of the big questions that I think have been floating around in my head and in the, in the heads of a lot of people who, who, who follow your, your, your team's developments very closely. But uh, is there anything else you'd like to share that you're working on that's exciting you right now or just that, you know, generally have on your mind? So beside what we discussed, I, I, I'm a learner as well. So I have done a little bit of finances. Um, I, as, as between my master studies and PhD, I worked in the city of London and helped um some um, people there to optimize portfolios and do the, the back office work. And I, I have very vague understanding of finances, but I try to learn. So I, I try to learn what are the financial instruments. And so there's one aspect of this is pressing the right buttons in the phantom wallet, for example. But also, the other side is to understand the mathematical um, modeling of these instruments. And in, in I feel in in few weeks uh, there might be an article describing this. So, for example, I wanted to understand staking and how can you optimize your staking strategy uh, by uh, using this idea of compounding interests. And um, so I'm, I'm a learner now as well, learning new financial instruments and trying to understand what are, what make the financial instruments of the blockchain world so exciting. And so with mathematics, I try to understand this in the next few months to come, 
and I hope I can share this. It's, it's not, I'm not an economist, so I'm, I, I can't brag about, uh, you know, my, my deep background in there. So, I mean, I, I can't, but I hope um, the community will like my uh, small little uh, detours in the finance world as well. And I, I hope with a little bit of high school math, we, we can tackle some understanding problems um, with these new financial instruments, which which is quite new um, in comparison to classical ones like stocks or saving books and and so on. Yeah, I had a chance to read the draft of that one. If I if I uh, if I'm thinking of the same one you're describing, and I, I really enjoyed it. I, I did notice it was uh, quite different from the kind of stuff you usually write, so I, I found that interesting. But uh, oh yeah, hopefully we'll have that published soon so everyone can take a look. Um, I guess just in wrapping up, you know, you've been in the software to some degree, the technology space for, for a long time now, what, what do you, what do you feel has turned changed now in terms of the general environment for, for builders and developers? Um, just even if that's a general feeling of, of optimism of, um, you know, difficult hurdles to overcome for somebody who's been in this space so long, I, you know, I think a lot of people that we end up talking to maybe are, are newer or they're younger developers. And so they don't have anything to compare it to like that. But I'd just be curious with your, with the amount of experience that you've under your belt, you know, what have you found uh, to have changed over time? So what I really like is the accessibility of information. When I started 1982 as a 10 year old boy, uh, countryside in Austria, it was very hard getting access. So in those days, there were hacker clubs and you needed sort of, you know, secret connections to get access to information. And now it's so easy. You know, you, you have uh, web pages like uh, Stack Overflow, you have um, a support community, uh, you, you have social media, but also you have online systems like GitHub and um, code repositories. So the whole ecosystem evolved so drastically the last 40 years that I see the entrance to become a programmer or the entrance level is, is so much lower than it used to be. Um, and I, I find this exciting. So everyone can be a programmer, everyone can learn about blockchain technology. And, and that I find amazing. And this is really the blessing of the internet and, and what, what it can deliver. I mean, it's, it's really that I find wonderful. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I love working about, uh, you know, about working in, at Phantom on and, and just really rolling out this technology for anybody anywhere to be able to use permission leastly, as long as they have access to the internet and a willingness to learn. So uh, it's exciting to be in the same mission together. And um, uh, I really enjoyed our conversation today. I hope we can uh, do this again in a, in a couple of months and hear all the updates from what your team has been up to. Um, but other than that, yeah, I appreciate the time. And uh, until next time. Thanks so much for this. Thanks, Bernard. See you soon. Bye-bye. And for everyone listening, you can uh, reach out to us at info at phantom.foundation if you're, if you're interested in the job postings that Bernard described. And make sure to follow us at phantomfdn on Twitter. Thanks so much.